Uh, so as per usual, I'll be reading out of the NASB 1995 translation. Uh, so if you have that translation, you'll, you'll better follow along. We also have uh, verses on the big old screen back there. Um, so yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 13. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we may might, uh, also might reign with you. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. And we toil, working with our hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. When we have become, at, uh, we have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. And so if you were with us last week, or if you listened to last week's lesson, you would have heard me kind of go on and on about humility and being humble and the importance of being humble and how we're all, um, as the word describes, just bottom row slaves, bottom row servants, right? And a quick glance at this passage um, might sound contradictory to what we were saying last week. So for instance, if you look at verse 8, it says, you are already filled you have already become rich, you have become kings without us, and indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. And so what we need to hear in these verses is actually this very sharp, biting sarcasm in Paul's tone. And how do we know that Paul is being sarcastic in these verses? Well, the clue that's given to us is actually in verse 7, the questioning in verse 7. It reads like this, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And so, Paul, earlier in this letter, he's made it clear over and over and time and time again, up until this point, Paul has made it clear that we have received the things of God by God's grace. And so he's kind of challenging the church at Corinth, by saying, who's calling you superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you acknowledge that you received it, why do you act like you didn't receive it? And so if we go back to chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, looking at verses 12 through 14, Paul lays this out for us. He says, Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. So he's driving this point home. We receive the Spirit. God has given us these things. Which things, verse 13, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So again, Paul is making this point. Everything that you have in regards to, well, everything in regards to everything, but more specifically, he's talking about in regards to these things of the Spirit, these things of God, they're given to you by the grace of God. And so we're reaching this point in this letter where Paul is saying, don't become arrogant because you didn't achieve these things, you received them. And so, there is this common theme amongst God's chosen people throughout all of history, right? And it is that humility is 
an extremely important attribute and characteristic that all of God's people must have and must practice. So even if we go all the way back to Abraham, in Genesis 18, 27, it says, And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. And so here we see Abraham recognizing that he is just created from the dust. When we see the words of Jacob in Genesis 32, 10, it says, I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. He's saying, I am unworthy of all the, un, uh, the loving kindness and all the faithfulness which has been shown to me. Moses, when speaking uh, to God in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And then we see this in Gideon. When Gideon is called to conquer the Midianites in Judges chapter 6, verse 15, he said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Even someone that we would view as great as John the Baptist, he also had to practice humility. In John chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And in the other Gospels, when Jesus does go to be baptized by John, in Matthew 3.14, it says that, But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Another example that we have is that Peter, when he witnessed the miracle of all the fish being caught when Jesus said, put your net on this side, and he pulled it up, and he couldn't pull it up, and the boat began to sink. And Peter doesn't say, wow, what a great blessing. Thank you, Lord. What does he say? In Luke 5, 8, he says, but when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Paul again reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And so this is the lesson that the Greeks and the church at Corinth, they hadn't learned this one yet, that in order to be child of God, God's chosen people, God's called people, you must be humble. You cannot be arrogant. You cannot be driven by your ego or self-righteousness or anything like that. And there are many cases, right, where new converts or baby Christians or immature Christians were, tend to get a little too prideful. Even long-time Christians, people have been Christians for a large majority of their lives, they can become too prideful. And so this is what Paul is addressing in the verses that we're looking at tonight. So we cannot be arrogant. We must be humble. And so he's continuing the thought that we had started last week. So if we go back to verse 6, it says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. So, the first thing to ask is, what things, right? So we see right there, it says, Now these things I have applied to myself and Apollos. And so we learn about what these things are in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So you see this figurative language here, right, about um, workers in the field. We learned about this a few weeks ago. And then if you look at chapter 3, verse 9, it says, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. 
And then verse 10 tells us, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. So in verse 6, the, these things that he's referring to, that he's applied to himself and to Apollos, are these um, analogies, right? These metaphors that he's using, uh, these figures of speech, if you will, that he's applying to himself to help teach the church of Corinth and to help teach us to remain humble. And so for a deeper look into these um, examples, right? We spent uh, one lesson just on the workers in the field. We spent a lesson on the builders of the building. And so if you want a, a deeper look in, into what Paul is applying here, I would recommend going and listening to those lessons. And so Paul is saying the reason why I'm applying these to myself and Apollo, again, Apollos, again, we see this in verse 6. So he says, now these things, brethren, I figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, which is extremely important. A lot of churches forget that one. Don't exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Now, again, we, we've talked about this a lot. The, the problem that Paul has been addressing in the, in the first part of this letter is these people forming these factions, and they're preferring, you know, I'm a follower of Paul, you guys like Apollos, and we're better than you, and you guys like Cephas or Peter or whoever, and they're kind of creating these factions, and the Greeks just have this tendency of doing that. They like picking their favorite philosophers, their favorite teachers, and kind of forming a little group, and that's like their team or whatever. Not, not much different than how we treat teams and teachers and leaders uh, these days. And so what Paul is saying is you can't become arrogant and you can't place your leader or your teacher or your pastor on some sort of pedestal because we're supposed to be humble, slave-like, trustworthy stewards as we had looked at in verses 1 through 5 last week. And so there's this weird kind of line that we tend to cross when it comes to, um, I think, thinking too highly of our leaders, teachers, and pastors. But there also is an appropriate time for honor as well. And so we're going we're gonna to get into this a little bit. Uh, for instance, 1 Thessalonians 5.12 tells us, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. So again, appreciate the teachers. In 1 Timothy 5.17, it says the elders who rule well, that's important, they have to rule well, not just because they're elders, but because they rule well, are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So what we can gather from that is there is this appropriate time and an appropriate way to honor your pastors, your leaders, and your teachers. But what happens is sometimes that that can be misplaced, right? And so one trap I think we, we can fall in is that we'll think of it as honor, but it's just self-righteousness that is dressed up as honor, right? We get a little too um, zealous for our favorite preachers or favorite teachers or, or favorite speakers, or even our own churches. You ever have like that, that like subconscious thought? I know I'm not the only one. The subconscious thought of you're talking to somebody and you find out they're a believer and you go, what church do you go to? And they name the church and you're like, you're not as good as my church. Come on. All of y'all do that. Not on purpose, but it happens. It happens. You've, you, you'll hear about, you know, someone's church. And you're like, I don't know about that pastor, man. You know? And, it, and it's this thing, right? And so we kind of think of it as like being loyal to our leaders and teachers, and we think we're honoring them in some kind of way, but, but oftentimes we can misplace that honor, and it's just self-righteousness that we've dressed up as honor. And so we actually have a good example of this in the Old Testament. So we're going to read a few verses in Numbers chapter 11. I'll give you guys a second to turn over there. I know we don't read out of Numbers very often. So open to Numbers 11, and then... Wipe the dust off those pages. 
And we're going to start in verse 24. And so the story here is, I, I guess just to kind of briefly do this, we all know that Moses is like the guy in Israel, right? He is the leader. He is the one talking directly to God. He is the one who's bringing the law from God himself down to the people, right? Moses is the guy. And a lot of us are aware that he has um, like an assistant, a, a protege, Joshua. And after Moses dies, Joshua takes his place and is the one who eventually gets the people of Israel into the promised land. <clears throat> And so what's happening here is there's this tent where the presence of God is, and this is where Moses uh, goes and talks to God. And so we have this interesting thing kind of play out here. So Numbers eleven twenty four says, So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. You know, pretty standard for Moses. Also, he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. So there's now Moses and a bunch of elders around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him. And he took of the spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the 70 elders. So the spirit of God falls on Moses. And then the spirit then gets placed on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. So they're just speaking the word of God, right? Not that silly prophecy that we hear about these days. They're just speaking the word of God, right? And then it says they did not do it again. Okay, so this is this little detail that gets put in there. So Moses, 70 elders, Spirit of God comes down. They prophesy, and once they prophesy, they don't do it again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad, or Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Again, that is also important. So these guys are still prophesying. And they're not prophesying falsely. The word tells us that the Spirit had rested upon them. And now they're among those who had been registered, but not, had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. And so rather than in the tent, they're prophesying out in the camp, kind of like in the general populace. And so verse 27, a young man, we don't know who, it's just a young man, he ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Madad are prophesying in the camp. Right? And so he's like, Moses, only, you know, you're supposed to be the one prophesying, not, not these two random guys. And so then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. Again, he's saying, you need to, you need to stop them. And then these are not going to be up there. I'm sorry. But uh, verse 29, keep reading in your Bible, it says, But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? And then Moses returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. And so what we see here is that Joshua, although well-intentioned and showing his loyalty and his honor to Moses, understanding that Moses is the God's chosen leader of the Israelites at this time, and he sees these guys who are uh, prophesying, and it seems a little out of order. And Joshua's like, Moses, you need to tell them to stop. And Moses says, "Are you? wait, hold on. Like, why? Are you jealous for my sake? Is what Moses asks. And he says, he says, you know, I'd rather that the Spirit be upon all people, that everyone was a prophet. And then Moses just returned to the camp. So Moses is showing Joshua that he had misplaced his loyalty. Moses, again, if you remember, back in Exodus, he says, who am I to free the people of Israel from Egypt? And so Moses has this attitude of, like, I don't even exalt myself. So Joshua, you don't need to exalt me either, right? We're just doing what God is commanding us. And so we're not supposed to become arrogant, and we're not supposed to boast. And so if we go back, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. This is where Paul kind of turns on his sarcasm just a little bit. He says, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So again, he's like, Guys, where, <laughs> where did you get your life and your breath from? Where does your salvation come from? 
What about your work ethic, your talent, your intellect? Where does any of this come from? Right? Who regards you superior? What do you have that God did not give to you? Right? And so these things that they had and these things that we have, these are gifts from the grace of God. And if you believe they are gifts, right, why are you pretending as though they're not? As if you had earned all of this. Right? It's incredibly crucial that we understand we did not earn salvation. We don't deserve our lives, right? And then Paul gets extra sarcastic in verse 8. He says, you, you're already filled. You have already become rich. You've become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that I had become kings. I wish that you had become kings so that we also might reign with you. And so, without the context, like the full context of Paul's letter, the, the church in Corinth would probably have nodded along to those last two verses. Like, you know... You're already filled. You've already become rich. They're probably like, yeah, actually, we're doing all right. You know, we got a big old church, lots of people, multicultural, you know, very, very intelligent group, right? Had they just read this one verse, they would have been like, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing all right. But at the end, Paul sheds some sincerity. So at the end of it, he says, right, so after, after kind of laying on the sarcasm, you know, you guys are already filled, you're already rich, you know, you have, you've already become kings. And then he says, you have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. And what Paul is saying in that last sentence, right? After he's gotten done, just kind of, you know, just wailing on him a little bit. There's, there's this sincerity that kind of comes out. And what he's saying is like, you know, I really wish you guys were kings. I wish you guys were as awesome as you thought you were. And that way we could all reign together, that we could be kings all together. Because what Paul is saying, or what Paul had been through, right? Paul had seen and suffered a lot, a lot. And if you read all of his letters, in almost every single one of them, there's like a, a phrase in there where he's like, you know, I, I wish I was done, guys. Like, I, I, I've, I've seen enough. I've, I've, I've been through a lot. I've suffered a lot. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. I'm poor. I'm always hungry and all this stuff, right? And so Paul is saying, I really wish you guys were kings already. And that way we could all reign together. He was ready for that millennial reign. He was ready for that final victory. And that's what he's saying there at the end of that verse. And then he kind of continues in, in that mindset. In and, and verse 9, he says, For I think God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. And so the word spectacle there, that's, that's an interesting term that's being used there. So if you look at what the Greek word is, the Greek word is theatron, right, which could mean theater or spectacle, right? And so obviously it gets translated here as spectacle. And if you think about, right, ancient Greece and uh, or the, the whole Greco-Roman era, right, what, what do their spectacles tend to be? Very violent, very graphic, very gory, right? And so uh, James Moffat, in his commentary on this particular verse, on uh, verse four or chapter four, verse nine, he says, "Stoics sometimes pride themselves on being a spectacle to the gods, as they won admiration by defying fate and misfortune, like men in the amphitheater bearing rough usage." And then he continues, "So Paul speaks in a tone of manly pathos." as he represents himself and his colleagues like gladiators who fought with wild beasts at the close of exhibitions. Generally, they were condemned criminals or prisoners who rarely came out alive. 
And so it's interesting that Paul decides to use the word spectacle, and he's using it in the same way that uh, you could compare it to gladiators who fought wild beasts, right? And uh, typically gladiators, right, they're not heroes, they're not heroic guys. Gladiators were condemned criminals, right? And so since they're already condemned to either a lifetime of prison or condemned to death, what they decided to do is, we're going to kill you anyways, we might as well enjoy killing you. And so they throw them into the ring with a lion or, or something or other stronger men and just so they could get slaughtered in front of a crowd of people. And so this is the spectacle that Paul is comparing himself and Apollos and what all Christians should be, is this spectacle already condemned by the world. And so the world just kinds to, kind of wants to persecute us for their own entertainment. It's kind of this approach, right? And so this really should keep us from becoming arrogant and egotistical and cocky and all these kinds of things, you know. Uh, this continues to reinforce this idea, right, that we're supposed to be slave-like, the bottom of the bottom. And so in Luke 9.48, we see this. Uh, Jesus kind of says the same thing here. And so Jesus says to them, to his disciples, Jesus talking to his disciples in Luke chapter 9, verse 48. And Jesus says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. So the lesson that Jesus is teaching his disciples here is like, whoever is the least of you, that's the one who's going to be great. And it's an interesting time when Jesus decides to bring this up. And so what had just transpired moments before this lesson is Jesus and three of his disciples went up a mountain. This is the story of the Mount of Transfiguration. And so Jesus transfigures into his full glory, and he's talking to Elijah and Moses, and uh, it's, you know, it's so intense that the disciples, they fall on the ground and they cover their eyes and and just the glory of the whole thing, right? It's this amazing scene. And then after this happens, Jesus and these, the three disciples, they go down. They meet with the rest of the disciples to come down the mountain. And then Jesus foretells his, his arrest and his death. And, he, and he's telling his disciples that he's going to be arrested and that he's going to be killed. And then the disciples start an argument. In verse nine, Luke chapter nine forty six, it says, "An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest." It's not the best time to bring this up, right? Jesus, your leader, your Lord, had just told you, right, that he's going to be arrested and killed, and the the first thing that comes to mind is, all right, so which of us is going to be the great one then, right? And so this is this is a problem for all human history, both past, present, and future, we, we, we can't help but try to become something great or wonder how we compare to other people and other things. And it's, it's just interesting, too, because even people who, who want to start ministries deal with this, right? Because they, they come at it with, you know, maybe hopefully the best of intentions. They genuinely have a passion for preaching the gospel and seeing people come to salvation and, or they really love expositing the word and, and putting in study. And then we, this little thought creeps in of maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll upload some videos and maybe I'll start teaching this and maybe I'll, you know, you know, ask my friends to let me preach at their church or let me, you know, and all this stuff. And, and it starts to build like this ego, right? And then it doesn't ever, you know, it almost never starts out that way, but it does creep in. And it's really, really, really easy to creep in. Even if you're not a preaching type, let's say you're like a musician, that's really, really hard to keep your ego in check when you're a musician, 
right? Especially if that's something you aspire to do professionally, right? And you can't help it but, you know, become comparative, become egotistical, and all these kinds of things. And so you have this thought of, I wonder if I could be great. And what Jesus is saying is saying, whoever is the least among all of you, this is the one who is great. And so if you think about how in Scripture it talks about how the 12 disciples, that they're going to kind of reign in, in, the, in the new kingdom, and they do have this high place of honor, but they all had to become the least. And if, if, like, if you think, like all of them died horrible, horrible deaths. They were all tortured. They were murdered, most of them, all of them except for John, right? But John died in exile and isolation. And he had to go through the whole revelation experience that couldn't have been fun. That had to be extremely intense, right? Uh, he even survived, you know, having boiling oil poured on him. And everyone else is beheaded, crucified upside down, crucified sideways. We have all these horrible things and because the world had made them a spectacle. The world saw their gospel as foolish, as Paul describes in chapters 2 and 3. And so they did become the least, and then they will be honored by God. And so when we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul again, he turns, the, he turns the sarcasm back on. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you, you're prudent in Christ. We are. Me and Apollos, guys like us, we're weak. You guys, you're strong. You're distinguished. And we are without honor. And so it says, we're fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. I think prudent is a very timely word for us. So if you don't know what prudent is, prudent is acting with or showing care and thought for the future. And so Paul is saying, you know, you guys think that we're foolish for preaching the gospel. And you guys are prudent. You guys are seemingly caring for the world. And I think that is so in line with what we see in a lot of churches today. You have people who call themselves Christians who do not preach the full gospel because they're thinking of themselves as being prudent, right? I said, don't teach that, that foolish repentance and, and how we're all inherently bad or that Jesus is the only way to heaven and the only way to the Father. He's like, no, 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 we need, we need to care about other people's beliefs. We need to make sure that they're comfortable. So we're going we're gonna to back off on the, the repentance and, and the ex exclusivity of Christianity and we're doing this because we care about these other people. It's like, if you care about these people, you would preach the truth and the full gospel. And so we see these people who are, you know, they view themselves as caring, right? And ironically, what they'll do is they'll turn around and they'll talk about how foolish people are for standing up for what the Bible actually says, right? They condemn people who are holding to the truth and preaching the truth, but because they care so much for the lost, they're going to leave out very important parts of the gospel, right? But they're the strong ones, right? They're the strong ones because they can entertain these teachings and these ideologies that are in stark contrast with the word of God. And we're, we're weak because we cling to this ancient and irrelevant book. Like it can't all be the word of God because there's some very problematic stuff in there. And so... You guys are weak for clinging on to this ancient book. You're not progressing like we are and, and allowing other societies and cultures and philosophies and ideologies to help shape this new, better gospel. And they're the distinguished ones. They're distinguished in their universal acceptance. And we were dishonorable for stating that Christianity is actually exclusive, right? And not all inclusive. And so Paul reminds the church of Corinth that the opposite is what's true, right? So after he just got done telling them, you know, we're, we're the fools, you guys are prudent. You guys are honorable, we're dishonorable. 
and all these things. And in verse 11, it says, To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and roughly treated and are homeless. Right? And so what he's saying is, what he's letting us know is that people will bow down to the culture so that they can be viewed as enlightened. So these people who shift and twist and, you know, leave out parts of the gospel and kind of re reshape it, or Christianity is like all warm and fuzzy and lovey-dovey and all this stuff, right? right? What they're doing, right, they're not seeking after the glory of God. They're wanting to be viewed as enlightened by the world. They're trying to elevate themselves. And Paul here is saying, look, to this present hour, right, up until now, we're hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, and we're homeless. And Jesus himself says something very similar. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so that is the reality of Christian living. And this is the kind of humility that we should have. Um, I can't remember who says it. I, I believe it's Paul Washer, but I don't know for sure, so don't quote me on this one. But he says something along the lines of, he goes, um, he's pastor and he's speaking with other pastors, and he goes, you know, the problem with pastors here in America and pastors today is the problem is nobody wants to kill them. Right? And so what he's trying to convey there is that people have peddled this soft gospel and have gotten away with it because there is no real consequence to being Christian. Like, we're simultaneously blessed and cursed to live on the side of the world that we live on because there's really not much challenging our Christianity. We have you know, moments of questioning or, you know, deeply emotional situations and scenarios. and But we don't really face real persecution, right? They're not throwing us in jail. They're not burning down our churches and our homes, not yet at least, right? And so there's nothing that really forces us to be humble, and there's nothing that really challenges us, you know, to, to, to see where we actually stand in our faith. We're, we're pretty good about showing up week after week and, and taking notes and hopefully staying in prayer and staying in the word and, and building up your faith and all that kind of stuff. And, and I pray that, that we don't have to face persecution, but I, I wonder that if it ever came upon us, how many of us would actually still stand strong? Because we do get to experience this blessed life of the freedom of persecution here, here in the States, right? We can, we can go to any church we want to. You know, we're, we're free to worship, right? And there's nothing that's really, really just kind of like, holding us down. And again, like I said, everyone has a story or an experience or a situation where, you know, they call, you know, they called their faith into question. Is God really real? Because I'm really struggling through this and that and this and that. Right. But I don't think any of us has ever faced jail time or murder or anything like that. Something that would really, really kind of push you to the edge. And so this reminder continues from Paul that this Christianity thing, this is not a walk in the park, right? And we're not supposed to behave like the world. And so in verses 12 and 13, he tells us, and we toil, working with our own hands, right? When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we, sl when we are slandered, we try to conciliate. When we have, uh, we have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. 
So in verse 12, it says we toil working with our hands. So working with hands, hard labor, uh, in that time period and in that culture, hard labor is for slaves, lower class citizens, that kind of thing. When you hear about ancient societies or older societies, you know, the rich, they never really did any hard work. They had slaves and servants to do the hard work for them, right? Uh, not much different these days, but it was more pronounced back then. And here Paul is saying, it's like, no, we do toil. We work with our hands, right? We're, again, we're the lowest of the low. And notice what Paul says in these verses. He doesn't say, if we're reviled, and if we're persecuted, and if we're slandered. He's saying, when. When we're slandered, when we're reviled, when we are persecuted. And so he kind of lays out for us the Christian response. It's when we're insulted, right, that's reviled, when we're insulted, we bless. And when we're persecuted, we endure. Now, to me, that one's interesting, right? When we're persecuted, we endure. Not when we're persecuted, we resist and we fight back and we conquer. He says, no, no, no. We just endure. We just endure. I think it's an intentional use of that word. Not um, we resist, we push back a little bit. It's like, no, no, no. When we're, when we're persecuted, we endure. And then slandered, right? When we're lied about, we conciliate. I had to look up what conciliate is. But it, basically, we prevent people from being angry and we gain goodwill. Meaning, if someone were to slander, to lie about us, to say horrible things like, oh, you know that's so-and-so, they go to church and they're blah, 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 fill in the blank, right? And it's our job not to go, no, uh -uh. what we're supposed to do is prevent people from being angry with us and to gain goodwill. And how do we do that? By just being good Christians, right? Being good Christians. And then he has this interesting phrase at the end. Uh, he says, we have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. So even up until now, he's like, we are scum and dregs, right? And scum, right? A lot, a lot of us, we have an idea what scum is. You guys know what dregs are? Dregs are, um, it's not like a specific thing. Here's an example. So a dreg is like, uh, you guys coffee drinkers? I'm a big coffee drinker. So when you drink coffee and you know you get to like the last little sip and in the bottom is the grounds and the beans and it's extra bitter and it's kind of really gross sometimes, dregs are the little flakes, the little things. So a dreg is anytime you have a drink, like a liquid, a liquid is these sedimentary solids that kind of hang out in the bottom. You know, see so if you're one of those weird people that likes pulp in your orange juice. Uh, and you drink it, and there's all the little baby worms at the bottom, you know, and it kind of feels weird, right? If you have a problem with texture like I do, dregs are disgusting, right? And that's, and that's what we are, right? We are the dregs, so the scum of the earth, the dregs of all things, right? And so it's important for us to understand this, to combat this need of being recognized, and I think, again, it's one of those things that, you know, like, like I mentioned before, yes, there are some times you, you will get to be honored and people will appreciate you for your work and your labor and, and whatever, like however it is that you serve, right? You, you will find those times of appreciation, but it's when you're seeking that appreciation is where things get to be dangerous, right? And we have to stop pretending that we're honoring when we're just being self-righteous, right? We can't misplace our loyalty. It's good to have leaders to rely on and to learn from and to be influenced by, but we cannot place these people so high that we forget what the word of God says, right? And, and again, we, we, have, we have to fight this trap because so many people are so well-meaning when they get into ministry and then they kind of lose sight of everything and they slowly look for, look for that honor 
and it's what ends up destroying them in the long run. Uh, John MacArthur uh, talks on this a little bit. He says, when you're tempted to covet a reputation, when you're tempted to covet influence, when you're tempted to be honored by the world, to be elevated by the church, you fall in into pride. So he's going to continue on here, but I'm going to hang out here for a second. So a lot of us are like, I don't care about my reputation. I don't care about how much influence I have. We're all lying when we say that. And then, you know, and I don't need to be honored by the world. And then he says, well, if you're wanting to be elevated by your church, some of us are like, okay, um, may, maybe I would, you know, like to be elevated by my church a little bit, right? Right, and we can we can all pretend that we don't care about our reputations, and we don't care about our influence, and we don't care about what the world thinks of us, even though we all do, we all do to some degree. Right, a lot of us are getting better about not caring so much, but we're human, we're naturally egotistical, and we want to be God. And so naturally, this is a trap we're going to fall into. This is we have to fight this fight this pride and this arrogance that is within all of us. And then he continues. He says, "The world may honor you for uh, for your things done. The world may elevate you. The church may honor you. The church may elevate you." And he says, "If if that's in God's will, and some men honor you, that's fine. If you're seeking God's glory, and that comes as a benefit." Okay, so if you're honored and you're doing it genuinely because you're seeking God's glory, that's fine. This is a benefit that comes with it. it says, but if you're seeking that, that's pride. So we have to be very, very careful, right? It's, it's okay to want to be appreciated and affirmed for your serving and, and the work that you do, but... If all you care about is the affirmation and the honor, you're wrong. And it's very easy for us to say things like, no, 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 I do it for the glory of God. I just, you know, I want to elevate God and all this kind of stuff. Really, really think about that then. Really, really think about that. Because as we all know, in, in Jeremiah, it tells us the heart, is sick and twisted. Who can understand it? Right? And so we go, no, no, no. I know that in the deepest parts of me, I just really want to see God glorified. Make sure that's the case then. Make sure that's the case. As soon as you have an inkling of, well, what if I do this? The one thing that I, I like to tell everyone is, let's say you feel called to a particular ministry and, and there's something that you want to invest in and kind of grow, always ask yourself why. Always ask yourself why. You know, uh, I, I always give the example, let's say you're a musician, you know, you wrote a really good song and say, go, maybe I should record it. Maybe I could put it up on YouTube or on my Instagram. Just immediately ask yourself why. Why do you want to? And then only you can answer that question honestly. You know, some people may genuinely, I have a hard time believing this, but some people genuinely, no, I want God to be praised through this thing and God really needs my help to spread this song around, right? All right? Now, that's unfair. I know I'm being unfair, but I just thought, I thought it was kind of funny. But, but you, really, you really need to keep, keep yourself in check. Just ask yourself, of all the things that you're doing and, and the things that you're involved with, involved with, just ask yourself, why? Why do I want to do this? Why do I want to continue in this? Am I being arrogant? Am I being prideful? Am I looking for recognition? Or do I actually want to see God glorified? And many, many, many examples in Scripture, God is glorified when these people are suffering, persecuted, when they're poor, they're broken, right? Because remember, Jesus said, whoever's the least, that's the one who will be great. So now we have this eternal perspective. Is it worth it for me to be great now? 
or should I just be the least? And whatever that looks like, right? It's hard for us to think of that because, like I said, we're, we're tremendously blessed on our side of the world, right? We're not all poor, broken, dirty, and hungry, right? But we also have this drive within us, right? And, and all these multiple opportunities to platform ourselves. And so you have to wonder, you have to ask yourself, okay, why? Why do I do the things that I do? Why do I want to continue doing the things that I do? And why do I want to pursue this or pursue that? And if you do, if you, if you really do want to be elevated by the world and honored by the world, just refuse to preach the truth. Just refuse to preach the truth and you will go far. Because we are going to be reviled by the world, slandered by the world. Fools, we are fools. We preach a foolish gospel. And we will be made a spectacle one day. And not in a good way. In the way that we talked about earlier. And so I want to encourage us with these words from James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you enter ver- encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in Nothing. So preach the truth. Seek after the glory of God. And if it comes with honor and affirmation and blessings, God is being extremely kind to you. But understand, right, that these are gifts from God, that you have received them, you have not achieved them. God is being gracious when these good things come our way. And sometimes we will encounter trials. And in those trials, our faith will be tested. And that will produce endurance because when we're persecuted, we endure. And through this endurance, endurance has a perfect result. That you will be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. So continue to run your race. Because one day we will stand before God. And he's going to ask us, What did we build with? Wood, straw, or did you build with gold, silver, and precious metals? Right? Why did you do what you did? Why were you serving in the place that you served? Were you being arrogant? Were you seeking for honor from the world? Were you seeking honor from your church? Were you hoping to be honored by God? And when you genuinely look for honor from God and you genuinely want to glorify God, it often looks like slander and persecution. And when that comes, consider it joy. Because one day you're going to stand before God, holy and blameless. Amen.